Can you hear me, ladies and gentlemen? Unaccustomed as I am to chairing, you will have noticed <laughs> this is my first appearance. Um, good afternoon. Have you had a good, uh, a good afternoon, a good day so far? Yeah. Okay. Well, it's certainly been very busy. We're going to do a QA, and um, and we have had a lot of questions submitted. Thank you for that. Um, from which we have whittled some. Um, especially carefully chosen ones, as you'll appreciate. And there's been no conferring, there's I promise no you. There's been no conferring. <laughs> I'm afraid you're too late. And I don't have that on a question form in front of me. Um, is that something we should talk about? It's at the end of this, isn't it? Right. And we'll talk about that at the end. Um, first question, and it's directed to Nigel Farage, and it's from Deborah Rennie, UKIP member in Hertfordshire. In your speech, you talked about divorcing ourselves amicably from the EU. Based on the fact that they don't want us to leave for oh so many reasons, how or why do you believe that this will be an amicable rather than an acrimonious divorce? Well, the Germans don't want us to leave, and that's certainly true. Um, you know, Merkel sees Britain as a potential ally in it, although I must say in the European Parliament, uh, there are many of the more federalist members who can't wait to see the back. Whether it's a Britain, UKIP or me, I'm not sure. <laughs> and it's possibly a combination of all three, I don't know. Um, no, I mean, there is a feeling, Steve, amongst many countries over there, or the governments of countries, that we've been the dog in the manger. You know, we said no to the euro, uh, we keep trying to opt out of various things, and us and the Danes are a damn nuisance. Uh, I think, in the end, this comes down to money. And I made the point this morning about how much more they sell us than we sell them. And I said, if you remember, I said that the real reason there'd be no trade difficulties and we'd sort things out in short order is because of the demands of a German motor car industry. And blow <laughs> me down, what did Lord Digby Jones say 10 minutes ago, that there'd be a free trade deal within 24 hours because actually, you know, it's vital to them um, as it is important to us. So I don't see why it needs to be uh, anything other than amicable. The one problem is this, that under the current treaties, under the Lisbon Treaty, the only mechanism by which we can withdraw is Article 50 of the Lisbon Treaty. Now, Article 50 uh, can be cited to renegotiate a relationship or to lead through to a divorce that takes two years. I have difficulty myself in recognizing the legitimacy of Article 50 because it's part of a treaty that should have been put to a referendum that actually was bullied through by Parliament, so I have difficulty. However, I have to accept that it is the law of the land. And I would say this, you know, if legally what we have to do is to enter into full divorce proceedings by using the legal article of that treaty, we will do so in an open and amicable spirit. But if we find that during the course of that time, we are frankly being had over a barrel and having the mickey taken out of us and not being treated fairly, then at that point, we would have to declare UDI and say to hell with Article 50, and then it would not be amicable. So I accept there are circumstances in which it would not be amicable, but please, can we make it our intention that we want it to be amicable? We want to be, as I said this morning, good Europeans. I love Europe. It's a great place. Let's trade with it, cooperate with it, and not be governed by it. Uh, the next question, which came from several people, was how in practice does the UK leave the EU? Is it by repealing Article 50? So we can, get, we can move straight on. I think, we do, I think we dealt with that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, move that one? Right. Um, this one, I think, is one that is directed to Paul Nuttall and Nigel, which is where does UK's policy stand on the Parliament for England issue? Paul. <laughs> oh, Paul loves this one. Go on. <laughs> um, well, my, 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 my view is, is quite simply that at the moment uh, we have a situation which is completely unacceptable. We have 
a Scottish Parliament, we have a Parliament for Northern Ireland, we have a uh, an Assembly for Wales, and whether we like it or not, they're not going to give up those devolved powers. In fact, the Welsh, only a couple of years ago, voted for increased powers for their assembly. So I think we've got to accept that we are where we are. And the fear that I have is that there is a growing resent resentment in England at the moment. We see that the Scottish, for example, get prescriptions for free. We see, for example, that their kids go to university for nothing, yet our kids have to pay £9,000 a year. And I think as the Scottish independence debate heats up and Salmon sees that he's beginning to lose, then his attacks on the English will become more wild. And I don't fear the breakup of the Union from Scotland because I think there's more chance of me landing on Mars tomorrow than Salmon's winning that vote. <laughs> However, the danger from the union, for the Union, and it's the Union that we all love, not the European Union, it's the real Union which has brought us peace and pr prosperity for the past 300 years, I believe could be broken and it will be broken by the English unless we do something about it and unless we give parity for England and I'm afraid we have to go some way of creating a federal UK and that will mean the creation in some form or another of an English Parliament. Um, that was from Janusz Polentius, by the way. So thank you, Janusz, for that. Um, right. A question from Alison Burke of Crawley in West Sussex. What are UKIP's views on assisting our soldiers that have returned from service and are suffering from PTSD and inability to adjust to normal life? Shall I pitch, pitch that first of all to Tim? Well, we think the military covenant should be as put into law as quickly as possible. We've got to look after these people. <laughs> I mean, you know, my background with the Taxpayers Alliance, you can find all the amount of money that they're frittering away in the councils. Um, enough that should go instead of uh, to all of these quangocrats and street football coordinators and diversity officers in the councils. Give them to the people who sacrifice their lives to fight for our safety. It's a no-brainer. Simple, easy. No, nothing more needs to be added to that. I think it was absolutely perfectly clear and distilled down beautifully. I agree 100%. Thank you. Um, Nigel, here's one for you. A vote for UKIP will let Labour in. <laughs> well, so they tell us. So they tell us. That is, of course, the big plan, isn't it? And the, uh, the money spent by Lord Ashcroft last weekend and the attempt to terrify people out of voting UKIP. Point number one, the next election is not a general election. The next election is a European election, and whoever you vote for will not influence who is in Downing Street, all right? So that's the next election. The second point to make is we draw our support from across the board in a way that uh, the Westminster media don't want to recognize. You know, they genuinely believe that every UKIP voter, and I apologize to the retired half colonels that are here from Salisbury Plain, but that is every UKIP voter, well it isn't. And we saw this in Eastleigh, when Lord Ashcroft did a lot of polling there too. And we found 30% of our votes came from the Tories, 30% of our votes came from the Liberal Democrats, 20% of our votes came from Old Labour, and over 10% of our votes came from people who had either never voted in their lives or who had not engaged in the democratic process for the last 20 years or more, and we'd re-engage them. And we should be proud of the fact that we draw it in from across the spectrum. But I would also, but I would also, Steve, if I may, reiterate one point. Frankly, what would the difference be anyway? I mean, I, I, 
I said earlier, I spent 20 years working in a small sector of Britain's financial services industry. I was involved with the metal exchange, the commodities business. Um, a thriving, booming business, a big earner for this country of invisible income, a, a market in which we dominate the world. And I spent 20 years there uh, before getting involved in this. And since 2010, we've handed over total control of that industry and of our financial services industry to Monsieur Barnier and three new regulatory European authorities. It doesn't make any difference for our small businesses or our big businesses or our manufacturing businesses whether we have a Labour or Tory government. We've handed over the levers over which we can give business a chance to Brussels. So even if it was right, even if that hypothesis was right, which I then accept, but even if it was, it wouldn't make any difference. And what will make a difference, what will make a real difference, is getting UKIP elected into the House of Commons. Now, that will change British politics. That seemed to work. I'm going to piss off now. Good one, you're ahead. Mr Chairman, if I, if I may come in. Yes, um, being involved in the by-elections, certainly in the north of the country, it is old Labour that is turning to UKIP. Not new Labour, old Labour. They come into the shops that we have, and they come in and go, finally, we now have a party that represents us. Do not shy away from the council estates. These are the people that want to vote for us. Nigel is quite right. It is people that have never voted before. It is people that haven't voted for 15, 20 years that are now turning to us because they finally found a party they can believe in and trust. So please, please, please go for the Labour vote. I mean, I don't see how this numerically adds up. I mean, if you look at Wales, the Conservatives are dead. If you look at Scotland, the Conservatives are dead. If you look at anywhere north of Birmingham, the Conservatives Dying. are dead. It's as simple as that. And quite frankly, the old argument that was used, that voting for UKIP was a wasted vote, was put to bed on May the 2nd, when we got 147 councillors elected. It's not a wasted vote. Yeah. Isn't that, I mean, Paul, isn't that right? In the council elections in the south of England and the east and the west, they said if you vote UKIP in these council elections, you'll get yeah. Labour. And in bits of the north, where we're drawing the Labour vote, they said to people, if you vote UKIP in the county council <laughs> elections, you'll get the Tories. <laughs> and what happened in 147 seats, and we were indeed second in 900 mm -hmm. seats, but what happened in nearly 150 seats was if they voted UKIP, what did they get? They got UKIP! Thank you very much. Sorry um, about that. Yeah, <laughs> I got a bit excited. I'm sorry about that. It's never been known before. Oh, well, there we are. Um, uh, here's one that I'm going to start with, Lisa. Uh, do you think that by tackling bad parenting, that we could save money on health, benefits, crime, and rather than talk about a two-tier education system again, we should be tackling, talking about aspiring to excellent education for all. So uh, uh, let's talk about the bad parenting side. Well, I hope you're not referring to me being a bad this parent by, North, by, <laughs> by coming to conference and uh, leaving my children with their grandma. Uh, no, I don't. I think what we need to do is look at our education system. We've heard a lot about education today. It's about what is our education teaching our children? Bad parenting. There are no rule books out there for being a good parent. You give birth and suddenly you're supposed to be the guru of becoming a parent. I've done it six times, so I kind of know where we're coming from. Am I a good parent or a bad parent? I've no idea. Ask my children. Um, actually, I firmly believe it's the education. I think our children are badly educated. They're not given good grounding. Um, I do believe that if we brought the grammar schools back, if they were disciplined properly in school, and I'll give you an ex uh, um, I had a, mo a moment at one of our schools where one of my children had not done as they should do, and they said, they've got to have a detention, but you've got to give us permission. And I said, why are you phoning me? My children are in your care, 
under your rules. If those rules have been broken, surely you should deal with them, not me, three, four hours later. So totally unacceptable. Schools need to take responsibility for the discipline and the education of our children and allow us to be good parents at home. Absolutely. Thank you. Tim, would you like to add to that on the education side? Well, you have schools now that are more trained towards passing exams and actually learning and teaching. Um, if we had academic selection, then we would have a, a better education system. There's nothing much more to add to that. Right, here's a question from Tom Rubithan, who I know is uh, very exercised on this subject because he writes to me a lot about it. <laughs> after, <you> <laughs> you. after Europe, immigration and wind farms, the biggest selling point we have on the doorsteps is our flat tax policy at 26% and 13,500 tax threshold. Can we maintain this policy? Well, he's wrong. It isn't, the it isn't the biggest seller on the doorsteps. The biggest seller on the doorsteps, actually, I think, is selective education, yeah. helping working class people get up the social ladder. That, to me, is far more important uh, than our tax policy. I'm not saying tax policy isn't important, but I think Tom's wrong about that. And I've knocked on just one or two doors over the years. Um, I Look, nobody has yet finalised their manifesto. What we've done today is we've, we've launched some new policy ideas, some very innovative, uh, very good and very strong policy ideas. We haven't finalised where we are on tax, but there are one or two certainties about UKIP tax policy, Chairman. You know, the first is, as we've said since 2006, we do not believe that anybody on the minimum wage should pay tax because yeah. we must incentivise people on benefits to get back to work. Right? That's clear. Yeah, absolutely. That's absolutely clear. And it was good news to see the Lib Dems last week shifting their policy to now, Clegg's speech, yeah. to now reflect that position. The other thing on tax that is clear is that when that economic genius, Gordon Brown, <laughs> Mr. Prudence, but when he became Chancellor in 97, the tax code in Britain was 5,000 pages long. When the Labour government left office, it was 12,000 pages long. It is now 13,000 pages long. Mm. We have the most complex tax system in the Western world. Um, uh, you know, when it comes to uh, credits, uh, the employees don't know about them and the employers can't work them out either. It's not working. So UKIP supports a mass simplification of the tax system. Let's reduce, <laughs> let's reduce even, let's reduce even the most complex of tax returns to one side of A4, and it can be done. Many countries have done it, the Baltic states, Russia, many countries have done it, and it can be done. What we have to decide as a party is do we have one set flat rate of tax, or oh, by the way, I forgot to say, abolish national insurance. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's not national insurance, it's tax. Absolutely. So bring it into one. Simplify the whole thing, and the political decision we have to make as a party is do we go for one rate, of tax, a flat tax, or do we go for a lower rate and a slightly higher rate? The slightly higher rate would certainly not be above 40%, but what do we do? And that's a political decision that we as a party have got to make. We haven't yet made our minds up on it. I tell you what, I'll put it forward. What a good idea to debate it at conference next year. If I can come in and just talk at it from a by-election and a, an election point of view, people do talk to us about tax, but they don't want to know about the flat tax. What they want to talk about is taking the low earners out, getting young people into the workplace, but the biggest thing they want to talk about is local democracy, taking the power back to local people. They love the fact that UKIP don't work, whip their local councillors, that they're there to represent them on the ground. So, you know, it's not complicated with what they're wanting. They're wanting power back to local people and giving them the opportunity to be represented by people that will actually represent and listen to them. If you make the deadly statement, I will engage the panel, comment on it, and try to something out before we leave and let you know what you're doing. 
Thank you very much. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we are, uh, time is moving on. Um, I'm sorry we can't take more of your, your questions at this point, but time, time is moving on. As you appreciate, it's been a packed day, and I think you'll agree, a, a day packed with extremely good things. Um, I have to say, and, and this, it was uh, something that was prompted by Roger Lees a little earlier on when we came onto the, the panel. Um, it is my role to make decisions, and sometimes those are popular and sometimes those are unpopular. And I have to announce that we have just withdrawn the whip from Godfrey Bloom pending a disciplinary hearing. Um, okay. I will, I will tell you why. Godfrey has um, had a couple of incidents today outside the hall here, elsewhere, which are now conditioning the media coverage of this conference. So, uh, essentially, we've done a lot of good work in this hall today, uh, and we were driving an extraordinarily positive agenda within the media up until lunchtime today, and that has gone out of the window, I'm afraid, and I spent an hour and a half sitting in the BBC studio this afternoon just answering one set of questions after another about, from all over the country, about what did Godfrey do today. Now, that is a shame because it overshadows what we're doing here uh, for the party. And so I have ta reluctantly taken the decision. This has been discussed with Godfrey, uh, and he accepts it. And uh, so we have withdrawn the writ from Godfrey this evening pending a disciplinary hearing which will confirm that decision or not and decide uh, how we go forward. So, um, sorry to be the bearer of that news, but there we go. Mm. Okay. 